Jill, we are ready whenever you are. All right. Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled, Can Walleye See the Bait on the Hook? This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Suzanne Gray from Ohio State University. Dr. Gray is an associate professor within Ohio State School of Environment and Natural Resources. Dr. Gray's research integrates physiological and behavioral ecology to advance understanding of the generation, maintenance, and conservation of aquatic biodiversity. She is interested in understanding why and how some animals can rapidly respond to human-induced environmental shifts while others cannot. And she uses freshwater fish as the model organism for explaining these mechanisms. We're delighted to have Dr. Gray here today to discuss her walleye research. Before we do that, a few things about the webinar. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. And afterwards, around 1220, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during your talk. And I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Gray at the end of her presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and it is being recorded for, to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we'll post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Suzanne Gray from Ohio State University who will present, Can Walleye See the Bait on the Hook? Dr. Gray. Thanks so much for the introduction, Jill. And thanks to all of you for uh, coming out to my talk today. This is really exciting. You get to hear me talk about fish, which is what I love to do. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can we see the screen? Looks great. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. So um, the question, can walleye see the bait on the hook? I'm going to it's 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 a big question, right? And I'm going to take a step back for a moment and think about um, why should we first of all why should we care what walleye can see? Uh, from my perspective, I think about individual fish and how they respond to environmental stressors, whether that's changes in the color and the clarity of the water or changes in the temperature of the water. How do fish sense those changes internally? How do they then react and respond? And what does that mean uh, across um, the, the lifespan of the fish, the population, the community of fish? So if we think about that from a, a bigger perspective, I think, we, I hope we can all see why we should care what walleye can see. They need to interact with uh, other members of their species. They need to find, so detect and eat uh, eat prey, avoid predators, all of the things they need to do to reproduce and survive. Uh, these are a very uh, visually dominated fish, so they use vision for a lot of these different tasks. Uh, how fish are interacting with each other and across the, the community is important for ecosystem health, so another reason why fish vision is, is important. And then, of course, there's the human dimension. So any of you who are anglers out there, uh, likely spend some time thinking about what lure you are going to use each time you go out to, to catch fish. And in the case of walleye, they are uh, visual hunters. They have color vision. They can see in really low light. We know these things. So um, really understanding what walleye can see uh, under different conditions is, is pretty important to this recreational angling industry, which is worth about $2 billion a year in Ohio. So another reason why understanding what walleye can see might be important to people. So can walleye see the bait on the hook? I am going to rather flippantly tell you that yes, they can. I'm gonna answer that question right up there. And, and one piece of evidence we have for that is the great walleye fishing that is happening right now on Lake Erie. So I've seen reports over the last couple of weeks, you know, people are going out, charter captains are taking their clients out and catching their limits, uh, six per, per angler. 
above the 15 inch uh, minimum size. So there are fish out there and they're being caught, which suggests that they are seeing the bait on the hook. And this graph uh, that was developed by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife shows on the X axis here, um, the year, so from the 90s up to 2020, and on the, the Y axis here, it's how many walleye were harvested per hour uh, each of those years. And you can see that the last few years have been really successful. There are lots of walleye being caught, and they're being caught on lures of all different colors, shapes, and sizes. So the answer is yes. But the question I'm really interested in is understanding, can walleye see the bait on the hook when water clarity decreases? For example, when there are big spring storms in this shallow western basin of Lake Erie, we get uh, these plumes of sediments coming into the lake, uh, as well as the lake bottom itself being stirred up. Uh, and those storms and events of having these huge turbidity plumes enter the lake are actually increasing because of climate change. So that's going to become more frequent, more severe. I'm also interested in what happens when there is a harmful algal bloom. Uh, and that changes the color of the water. So on the bottom satellite image, you can see, I think this was 2015, the big uh, harmful algal bloom that covered much of the Western Basin and, and other parts of the Central Basin of the lake. So what does that do to the ability of fish to detect their prey or detect lures on a hook? And again, thinking about an individual fish. So if we're thinking about an individual walleye, it is going to experience a, a huge range in visual conditions within a season, let alone uh, across its lifetime. So within a season in the Western Basin of Lake Erie, you can have those spring storms, makes the water really uh, muddy, murky. Uh, early summer, you might have a lot more clear conditions. Now the Western Basin is still relatively uh, turbid compared to other lakes. So there's a, a low level of, of sediments kind of always in the water. And then later in the summer, you can get these harmful algal blooms, these big mats of al algae, you know, uh, sitting up there on the water, again, changing the color and clarity of the water underneath. So what does that actually look like for a fish? So this graph shows the wavelength. So this is the visual, visible spectrum of light that humans can see and walleye too. Walleye have uh, color vision um, in sort of the green and orange ranges of the spectrum. Uh, on the y-axis is light intensity. So how bright is the light? This blue line represents a measurement of light that we took underwater in Lake Erie on a bright day where the water was really clear. Okay, so clear water conditions, you can see lots of light intensity, it's bright light underwater, and it's also broad spectrum. Across the whole spectrum, there is light available for vision. Now, if you stir up the bottom, you add in those sediments um, floating around in the water, there's going to be a lot of scattering of light, and those particles can also absorb light. I should have mentioned that a, a definition of turbidity is it is a measure of the amount of suspended particles in the water column. And those could be sediments or they could be algal cells. No matter what, those particles are going to scatter and absorb light differently uh, depending on the type of the particle. So we add in the mud, basically the silt, the sediments. And what we see is a decrease in the light intensity. So there's lower light underwater and also a narrowing of uh, the, the spectrum of light that's available. So fewer colors of light are actually available for vision when it's, uh, the water is muddy and, and turbid like this. Now, if you then measure the light underwater in, an, in a harmful algal bloom, we get a further reduction in the amount of light underwater, as well as a, a pretty significant shift in the color of light that is available for vision. So imagine putting on a pair of goggles that have green lenses and walking around and trying to distinguish everything in the world around you with these green goggles on all the time. Uh, it's kind of like that. So that's what a fish might be experiencing. And again, it's important to note that the, the harmful algal blooms, when it's composed largely of microcystis, which is a cyanobacteria, um, when it proliferates, it, it floats. So it's actually on the top you know, I, I'm not exactly sure the depth, but um, the top layer of the water is where you get this concentration of algal cells uh, in a harmful algal bloom um, composed of microcystis. 
uh, the light that's entering the water still gets filtered by that layer of, of algae. So um, the scattering and absorption of light still happens. So underneath it, there's still gonna be just that green light, even though the water clarity is, is, is okay. Um, so changes in the color and clarity of light. And what we're really interested in understanding then is can fish see the bait on the hook uh, under these different conditions? And how does that change? And I wanna introduce you to the team. I don't do any of this work in isolation and actually the fun work where you actually get to go and catch the fish is typically done by the students in my lab. They get to have most of the fun. Um, these are three former students, Taylor Rayback, Chelsea Neiman, and Andy Opliger, who contributed significantly to the work I'm going to talk about uh, today. And then my collaborators in the School of Environment and Natural Resources, Eugene Bragg and Jeremy Brasscotter, uh, as well as a host of volunteer anglers for one of the studies that I'm going to, to talk about. So that's the team that we, we are thinking about today. Uh, the way we decided to tackle this question, can, can walleye see the bait on the hook, was a, a three-pronged approach. So uh, first we did some experiments in the lab where we tried to assess the basic visual abilities of walleye under different um, water color and clarity conditions. We then performed a citizen science project where we enlisted the help of Lake Erie charter captains we developed a, a phone app and they helped us to gather data on lure colors, uh, walleye catches and watercolor and clarity that we could kind of combine to understand, you know, just in general, what colors of lures are, are important for catching walleye under different conditions. And then we actually used that data to predict what we might find if we went out and sought out different water color and clarity conditions. So we put lures in the water, could we predict what color lures would be most successful? So we did a controlled angling experiment. I'm gonna focus my attention today on that third experiment, uh, but I will talk just briefly about what we found in, in the first two projects, um, just for those of you who haven't kind of seen those earlier, earlier talks. So first we did these vision experiments. We did a whole series of experiments on both walleye and their preferred prey, emerald shiner. I will just talk about the walleye here. So um, we wanted to understand under these different um, turbidity conditions, how well could they see? So we tested individual walleye in sedimentary turbidity in a combination here in the middle of um, sediments and algae and then finally just in, in algae. And we use this apparatus, it's called an optimotor response test. And this is a, a cool way that we can figure out at what level of turbidity or light intensity or you know, color of, of light <clears throat> do the fish stop being able to see. So we're looking for a visual detection threshold. You put the fish in this um, round tank and then you slowly rotate uh, a black and white barred screen. So it's just slowly moving around the outside of the tank. And uh, most visual creatures have what's called an innate optokinetic, optokinetic response where they will actually follow the black and white bars for as long as they can detect a difference between black and white. So if there's enough light available for their visual system, they will follow the fish around or sorry, the fish will follow the bars around. So they actually swim along with the grating and we're just slowly increasing the turbidity, either using sediments, a combination of sediments and algae or just algae. And at some point, the fish will stop swimming and is essentially their way of saying, we can't see the difference between black and white anymore. It's too dark or it's too green, um, those, those sort of things. So we can use these tests to understand their, their ability to see under different conditions. So these are the results for the walleye. On the x-axis, we have the treatment. So we have the three different treatments here. And then on the y-axis is the detection threshold. So at what level of turbidity were, did they stop swimming in this circular tank? And, and so basically saying, they can't see beyond this point. So the, the walleye actually did really well under sedimentary turbidity, right? They could see up to almost 80, 90 NTU, which is a measure of turbidity. 
Um, and this was this was actually as expected. So, like I said, the Western Basin has some low level of, of turbidity um, most of the time, and it has historically. So this these fish have lived here for quite a long time since the last ice age, um, and we expect them to have decent vision uh, under these conditions, which, as you can see, they do. So. What was really interesting, though, is if you look at this last bar, when we were increasing turbidity by, by, by adding algae, there was a, a, a sorry a forty percent reduction in their visual detection threshold. So at about thirty to forty NTU, the fish of, of algal turbidity, the fish were no longer able to detect the difference between the black and white bars. They essentially um, lost their ability to see at that level. So uh, this was really, really incredible uh, to, to, find, um, to find this result. We also did some tests to see how far away a walleye needed to be from an emerald shiner, one of its preferred prey items, in order to detect that prey item. And there was a, the, the fish actually needed to be 15% closer to the prey to even detect it when it was algal turbidity compared to when it was uh, suspended sediments. So another uh, really cool experiment that showed us that vision in walleye is variable across these different conditions. So the next project that we did uh, was looking at um, the successful catch of walleye across uh, different conditions that people were actually out fishing in. So we enlisted here the help of Lake Erie uh, charter captains. And for any of you that are out there and, and who worked on this app with us, thank you so much. The app itself was developed by Chelsea Neiman, who was a PhD student in my lab at the time. Um, she did a phenomenal job. And over several years, we collected several hundred data points where we were asking captains to report in on, you know, if they caught a walleye, take a picture of the walleye, take a picture of the lure that was used to catch it, and take a picture of the water uh, so that we could ascertain the uh, color and clarity of the water under which that fish was caught using a particular lure. And so, um, <clears throat> like I said, we caught several hundred uh, data points. Now this graph is a little bit um, maybe difficult to understand. I'm going to walk you through it. So we had three different groupings of water color and clarity. There were days when the water was uh, full of algae, so it was kind of green and murky, uh, so in green. And then we had clear days, the water looked like it was fairly not much sediment, not much algae. And then we also had days where, you know, maybe there had been a storm the previous day, and so there was a lot of sediment in the water. So we have three uh, water color clarity groups. And then here in this graph, we have, it's called, we used a, a discriminant function analysis, which is a statistical test that can take a whole bunch of data uh, and tell us if there are particular groupings or weightings where we see common, um, common data points kind of grouped together. So basically what we had is um, three base lower colors. So lures are, many colors. Uh, typically, you're not just a solid color, you've got a lot of different pattern elements. We broke that down into looking at the base or the, the color that made up the majority of the lore. So lures that were predominantly white, for example, ended up um, being used and being successful in catching walleye when the water was clear. When the water was um, turbid with the sediments, we found that yellow or gold lures were, were typically most successful. And then um, in algal conditions, we found that black lures were being used and being successful in catching walleye. Um, so this was really interesting. This is showing that there is some variation in which base colors are more successful at catching walleye under different conditions. Um, there were some limitations with this study, uh, and we actually talked with and got a lot of feedback from the charter captains who were involved. Um, one of them was that it was kind of a big process to have to do 
as people are bringing in fish. So you're out there having your day of fishing with your friends and family. <clears throat> you don't necessarily want to stop and do this little, little science experiment every time you catch a fish. You're trying to catch your limit. You're trying to enjoy your day. And, and so a lot of times what we were hearing from captains was that the days that they had the time to kind of report in and use the app were slower days. And it was a great way to maybe um, interact with the clients when it was a bit slower, they got to do some science, but um, it means we were missing a lot of the key data that was when, when the fish are hitting constantly all day, that's um, some data we were missing, but still um, interesting nonetheless. So I just want to <clears throat> say that from this, we wanted to translate this information that we have to <clears throat> back to the real world. So we wanted to do some experiments, excuse me, um, <clears throat> where we thought about these different lore colors and we, we presented them to the fish at the same time under a particular condition and asked the fish, which one would they choose, basically? And that's what led us to our controlled angling experiment. So <clears throat> in this experiment, we used four different lure colors based on that previous study. So we used white, gold, black, and purple. Purple we threw in just as an extra. <clears throat> we fished, <clears throat> four people were fishing at a time, one lure color, uh, each with a different lure color. Um, we did six trips where we were fishing in clear water, six trips in turbid water, and three trips in um, when there was an algal bloom. Sorry, having a bit of a cold. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so we did this controlled angling. We did a bunch of trips. We were fishing these different lure colors. And we did a really interesting analysis. Again, this was Chelsea Neiman was responsible for the analysis. Um, <clears throat> basically, I'm just going to run you through an example of what the graphs are going to look like so that you understand sort of what we're seeing. So in this example, um, if you look at population, let's pretend, <clears throat> sorry, one moment. <clears throat> so if we pretend that population one and two are bees, and they're searching out flowers. They both, <clears throat> they both have access to red flowers and blue flowers. Um, in population one, the red line represents all the red flowers they visited, and the blue line represents all the blue flowers the bees visited. Now, in this analysis, we have a, a, a threshold, um, <clears throat> And if you're um, above that threshold, it means there is a preference for uh, a particular colored flower. But as you can see here, both peaks are below that line. So basically there is no preference for either blue or red flowers. But if you look at population two, um, you can see that the, the, the blue peak here of this line is above that threshold. So it means when given a choice between red and blue flowers, <clears throat> the bees are going to choose the blue flowers. <clears throat> One moment, I'm just going to get a drink. Okay, now for the big reveal. <clears throat> okay, so from our experiment, we use this analysis to understand if the fish preferred any of these four lure colors in a given water condition. And what we found was that in clear water, all the peaks for all the different lure colors, as you can see here, were below this um, line, meaning there was no preference. They would just pick whichever color they saw first maybe. And then in, um, in turbid conditions, when it was sedimentary turbidity, the, um, what you can see is that the yellow line representing the gold lure, the peak is above this um, 
sort of arbitrary 0.25 or 0.25, sorry, meaning that given a choice between all the different lure colors, the probability that the fish are going to strike on a gold lure is much higher than they're going to strike on any other color lure. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, under algal conditions. Now we only had three trips where we got out uh, fishing in algal conditions, but there is some indication if you look at the black line, which peaks just here uh, on the graph, uh, indicates that given a choice between all four lure colors in algal conditions, the fish seem to prefer black lures compared to all of the others. So this was really cool. Cool because there was a preference detected and we had fairly low sample sizes here, but also cool because it corroborates the evidence that we gathered from the charter captains, right? Showing that under sedimentary conditions, gold lures are the way to go. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, actually <laughs> should have mentioned this, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, we were casting. We were casting eerie dearies and we were drifting, right? A lot of people um, these days when they're fishing for walleye, they're trolling and they're not using eerie dearies. So this was one difference um, kind of in what we're doing compared to what a lot of charter captains are doing. But still, we saw this um, really cool, cool evidence of a preference for different colors under different water quality conditions. So just to summarize quickly, uh, we saw vision differences in the fish when we looked in the lab. We saw lower color success differences when we asked charter captains to send us in data. And we saw lower preference um, variation across the watercolor conditions um, based on our controlled angling experience. So we're starting to understand not just that while well, I can see the bait on the hook, but um, it's complicated. It depends on water color and clarity. And that's, that's pretty cool. So we're learning a lot about the fish. Um, we've actually done quite a bit of work understanding the vision of Emerald Shiner, one of their preferred prey items under different water color and clarity conditions. So what's next? Uh, we're also going to be looking at the different uh, sensory systems within fish. Fish has amazing sensory systems. Uh, they can use uh, taste, olfaction, hearing, um, and we're going to start to look at how, um, how those might play into uh, their ability to de detect lures and, and their prey um, if water conditions change. We also want to recognize, as I was just mentioning, that our experiment uh, used a method uh, that I think people were using more in like the 80s and 90s, the casting and drifting with eerie dearies. A lot of people now use much more uh, sort of sophisticated technologies. They're using their um, fish finders. They're using different types of lures, different colors, every color you can imagine and combinations, some that are just completely outlandish and you would never see in nature and some that try to mimic the preferred prey items. Uh, so we want to try to start understanding uh, more about the dynamics of lures um, and how the fish might detect them when they're moving through the water, the way that they move, um, and, and the combinations of color that might be important in, in what the fish are, are looking at and cueing in on. So that's some work that we're, we're trying to start now. And then finally, we also want to adapt and expand the walleye track tracker. We would love to get more information from the general public, from more charter captains on lure colors. Um, so we're trying to find a way to simplify the app uh, to make it really easy to quickly send us some info on you know, what lure colors you're using and that sort of thing. So with that, uh, there's lots of people and funders to thank uh, and I will, will stop there, thanks. I guess I can stop sharing my sh screen, Jill. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, we have gotten some great questions during the presentation. So let me get started and ask Dr. Gray as many as we can. And what questions she can't answer today, we'll post later on 
on the website with her question or her answers. Um, well, so the first question I have is, um, and these are like some clarifying questions from some of the slides. So I just kind of want to knock those out first. Um, one of the questions I, uh, that we got was during the citizen science project, um, were the fish being caught at the surface or at a certain depth? Um, at depth, <clears throat> mostly you, you catch walleye kind of closer to the bottom, I believe. So um, at depth, and we actually do have the data on depth and there was some variation in uh, lure colors that were successful at different depths, um, but we didn't have quite enough information to kind of use that in our study. Okay. So the Western Basin of Lake Erie is not particularly deep. And so there wasn't a ton of variation. And that's where I think most of our charter captain information was coming from. Um, it would be cool to get information on people fishing at all different depths, that sort of thing. All right, another question that we had, um, and this is just a clarifying question because people were asking about purple lure. And so what, 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 so there was, black was the one, where did purple fall in? Just to clarify that, of sure. what, where did purple, <clears throat> since that is a favorite one. Um, so purple, it did fall out in one of our analyses separate from sort of black, white, and gold, which is why we did include it. That was from the citizen science data. Um, so that is why we did include it in our controlled angling. Um, it was never a preferred color in the controlled angling experiment, but it did have some success kind of across the board, I believe, um, uh, in the citizen science experiment. So pur purple did come out as something, a, a component of a lure color, like, so lures are so colorful these days. You know, they're, they're beautiful works of art, really. Um, and having some component of purple seems to be important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, another question we, had was when you told the captains what you found, were they surprised at what you found with the with your experiments later? Uh, so I don't know that the charter captains would have necessarily seen the results of project three until right now, if they're there. They may have from Chelsea Neiman. She gave some reports as we were going along. Um, I think one thing that is, is really cool is that it, when we first started meeting with the Lake Erie Charter Boat Association um, captains <clears throat> who were interested in, in participating, um, one of them in particular said, use a gold Erie Deary. Just, you know, and he'd been fishing in the lake for many years. Use a gold Erie Deary. And what we found was in kind of low levels of sedimentary turbidity, yeah, you should use a gold Erie Deary, like he said. And if you think about sort of the historical conditions of the Western Basin, would have had and, and do have some le low level of um, sedimentary turbidity. And so it, it makes sense. And what was, I thought it was really cool that, you know, the knowledge that the captains and other anglers have was fitting with the science that we were finding. I think one of the reasons I do the work I do is sort of the concern that with more storms with climate change, we're gonna get more storms, more severe storms. That level of turbidity is gonna get elevated even more beyond what the fish are normally used to. And that's where we wanna kind of then understand if we need to change those colors or whatever. But anyway, so the point was, yes, not, I'm not surprised. I think, I think the captains were like, yep, <laughs> uh, at least for the, at least for the, in, in the sedimentary condition. Okay. So that was cool. Yeah, that is. Um, another question uh, that we got was, did your research show changes or variations in senses by age, point in migration or migrating of the I mean, fish? That is, an, um, that is a cool question. <laughs> and uh, our research did not go that far. So we are interested in trying to figure out, um, so we know that um, algal blooms, uh, changes the pH of the water 
And that in other fish species has actually influenced their ability to smell. And so we have actually done one pilot study where we were looking at um, changes in or changes in vision and olfaction together when um, you know the visual environment changed and the you know the chemical um, the chemical environment changed as well. So it's something we're looking into now in terms of ontogenetic shifts. So shifts through an individual's time, their lifetime. Um, you know, young walleye do best under turbid waters, right? Sedimentary turbidity, anyway. Um, so their ability to, um, they're, they're eating plankton, they're eating something different. We expect them to shift uh, their vision as they grow older and are then migrating out. Now, beyond that, I don't have any evidence. We haven't done those sort of experiments yet, um, but great, great question. Something we need to look into as they're migrating into clearer waters in the Eastern Basin. Um, let me see, I've, we're going to do another five minutes of questions and whatever questions Dr. Gray doesn't get to, we will get them posted. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about the fish's other senses. Um, and specifically there was one that was dealing with, um, how well they can hear and if, um, in like say muddy waters and do they hear the rattles of lures? So a lot of fish do have excellent hearing. Um, uh, so the potential to hear the rattling is uh, definitely there. Have we tested it? No. <laughs> that is uh, among those what's next kind of projects, uh, especially thinking about if you're in muddy water, vision is um, your, your, your ability, the fish's ability to see is, um, um, hindered in some way. So then how might they use those other senses? Are they switching to using different sensory modalities? So are they, tr you know, focusing in more on a scent? Are they focusing in more on a sound like the rattling of lures? It is possible. And we know these sort of things happen in, in other species. Um, uh, it's just not, as far as I know, been done specifically in walleye uh, in Lake Erie. So. All right. Great. Another great research project. <laughs> yeah, we, I think I we've got quite a few. When we relay these to you, you'll have a lot. <laughs> okay. I just need money and students and we'll get it done. There you go. <laughs> um, another question was, will all this apply to inland water fishing too? Yes. <clears throat> In the sense that understanding the vision or the other sensory systems of uh, the fish that you are targeting is important. Now, I can tell you right now that walleye have a different visual system than say smallmouth bass, right? The colors that they can see are different. And um, so the wavelengths of light that they are capable of detecting are different among species. So how they respond to these different water conditions is going to vary by species. Um, as someone said earlier, asked earlier, it could even depend on the age of the fish. Um, so I would say you could translate it in the fact that it's important to understand. Um, you can't necessarily try to use a black lure under algal conditions to catch a bass, right? Um, it, that doesn't necessarily translate um, specifically, but uh, for walleye, it should hold. Um. Two more questions. First one is, um, and this uh, this is dealing specific. Uh, this is dealing with um, algal blooms. Um, have the algal blooms caused fish to go deeper into the water? I do not know the answer specifically to that question. So it's one we've been thinking of. Do the fish actively avoid? the blooms. Um, another suggestion could be that um, some, someone has also suggested that the edge of a bloom could act as a really good refuge for a predator to hang out in, right? Because if the, the prey fish are actually avoiding the bloom because of how it might affect their vision or other senses or their behavior, 
you know, it might be a good place to hang out um, to, to catch prey, but we don't know the answer to that question. I think there are um, collaborators and, and colleagues out there who are doing such cool work on tracking walleye throughout the entire lake um, that, that they might be able to help uh, a bit with that, um, more so than the kind of data that I have. Um, the GLADOS network, I'll just shout out to them. They're the ones who are doing the um, extensive tracking and monitoring of uh, walleye and other species movement in the lake. All right. Um, the last question that I have is, um, have you seen any, um, any long-term effect on walleye's eyes when it's when, with turbidity and harmful algal blooms, or is that something that that just hasn't been studied yet? It has not been studied yet. Um, so I, you know, the, I think the potential is there over the long term for vision to change. Other species of fish have um, over time um, had, you know, permanently altered visual abilities um, due to the uh, visual environment that they're, they're now in. So that can happen, whether or not it would happen with walleye, it's hard to say, especially where right now, um, like I was saying earlier on in the talk, where they experience, um, you know, such variation in visual conditions within one season, let alone from season to season as a long-lived um, species. So the potential is there. We actually did what I think was a really cool study where we looked at emerald shiner vision and changes through time. So through the Museum of Biological Diversity here at The Ohio State University, um, they let us look at emerald shiners that were caught starting in 1910 through to, we had fish up to the 20, I wanna say 18. Um, and so we were actually able to look at the, the relative size of the fish eyeballs from you know, the early 1900s through till 2018, every, every five years or every decade. And there were some correlations between changes in, in the lake and the size of the eyes through generations. Um, we haven't finalized that work yet, but that was for Emerald Shiner. All right. Well, this is very interesting. Well, so we our time is up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gray, for your willingness to talk to us today about your walleye research. Um, we are, uh, this was really an excellent discussion, and we have quite a few questions that we will be posing back out to Dr. Su uh, to Dr. Gray in order for her to answer. Um, also, a big thank you to Christina Dierkes for her work organizing this webinar series. Uh, I did want to remind everyone that our survey URL is in uh, the chat feature for this webinar, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Dr. Jason Huntley, who will be talking about his research using bacteria to remove microcystin from drinking water. The registration link is in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Gray. Very cool presentation. And thank you all to, for attending this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dr. Gray. Thank you.